Jesus paid the fare. Amen. Amen. I know I'm going. He promised me in his word. The Bible tells me I've got a home in heaven. Amen. Amen. I'm part of the redeemed. Amen. Take your Bible with me this morning. We're going to turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to cover verses 19 through 29. We're going to get done with chapter 3 this morning. We're going to finish this. Very, very, very important chapter of the Word of God. And I know it's it's very technical. I know it's it's one of the most technical, probably, verses uh, uh, to explain law and grace uh, passages in the Bible, but it's very essential that we get these things hammered down in our in our heart and mind so that we, we don't ever go back on that and begin to think that we've got to do this or we've got to do that to please God. You know, if I don't do the God, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we shouldn't live righteous lives. I'm not saying we shouldn't strive to be holy every day we live. But the fact of the matter is, our works are never going to please God. Amen. Unless uh, the only way our works please God is if God is working through us and in us. Right. Amen. And that's and that's when we are surrendered and submitted and in a in a in a dependent walk with the Lord Jesus, and then what he does through us is him, it's not us, and we can, we can simply say, that's the Lord working through me, and give him the glory. That's what he wants to do. He wants us to be a vessel that he uses for his honor and his glory. You know, you could have a teacup in your cabinet and never drink out of it. It'd be pretty to look at, but that's not what it's designed for, is it? It's designed to be used. And God made me and you, and he didn't make us to be to sit and look pretty to look at. God made us to work, to serve him, to be used by him for his glory. Not in order to please him, but in order to give him glory. Amen? All right, let's get into this and let's read and let's, let's understand some things this morning. Of why, why the law is even there, okay? That's really primarily what we're looking at. What was the purpose of the law? Uh, so, so let's begin here this morning, Galatians 3, 19 through 20. Let's begin with a word of prayer and ask God to meet with us this morning. Father, I love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that, that you give us uh, specifically ins instructions that we need, Father. I'm thankful for doctrine. I'm thankful this morning, Lord, that the word of God is so clear. And Lord, what a privilege it is to know that I'm not saved by works. What a privilege it is to know that my works cannot... Uh, my works 
They don't, they don't make a dent in anything when it comes to, when it comes to my righteousness. Lord, I never need to depend on my works for my own righteousness. Oh, Lord, help, help me to understand always that it's, that it's your righteousness that I need and mine are nothing. Lord, please help us to understand these truths this morning. Help us to understand the purpose. And, Lord, I just pray, Father, that you'll speak to us by, by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, and we'll give you glory for it, Lord. We'll thank you and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through 29. Let's look at the first three verses of that, beginning there in verse 19. Amen. And Paul says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to him to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So the question there was asked, what is basically, what's the purpose of the law? Wherefore then, then serveth the law? Well, the question is answered. It was added because of transgressions. So part of the reason the law was given was to restrain the transgression of men by clearly revealing God's holy standard to them. And, and God had to give us his standard so we wouldn't destroy ourselves. Well, not us, but so man wouldn't destroy himself before the Messiah came. So God had the restrictions. This is how you live in order that you don't absolutely ruin yourself. Here's my standard. All right? But, but the law is also, is also added because of transgressions in another way. The law also, when, we, when you preach the law, what does it do? It, star, it stirs up in a man a carnal rebellion. And, I'll, and I could prove that to you if it wasn't so cold and we could all go down on the street corner this morning and just stand out there for a while preaching some of God's rules and some of God's law. If you get out there and preach the Ten Commandments on the street corner, you're going to make somebody upset. They say, hey, I wish you'd quit preaching that. Get off here. Hey, well, this ain't no church house. Put that back in the walls of the church. Y'all get back in the walls of the church where y'all belong. They say things like that to you. Why? Because when you preach the Word of God, it, it pricks men. The Holy Spirit pricks their conscience. And it causes their rebellion to get stirred up in them by revealing a standard. They say, hey, well, that, that, that may be his, but I don't know that that's mine. And it shows us, what it ends up doing is showing us more clearly that we have a need for salvation in Jesus Christ. Romans 7, 5 through 8 says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, in other words, we didn't know, we didn't know we were sinners, but... We were in the flesh, the motion of sin, which were by the law, which were by the law. In other words, the law told us it was sin. Did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Okay, if you didn't know, if you didn't know that sin was wrong, and then all of a sudden you read and found out that sin was wrong, you realized this is killing me. Okay, so that's what that's saying. It did bring fruit forth fruit unto death. The end of the end of sin is death. It's the end of sin is hell. And, and he says, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. In other words, the old me is dead. I'm new in Christ. He said, and we should serve in the newness of spirit, the new creature that we are since we've been saved in Christ, and not in the oldness of the letter. In other words, we should not continue to live as though we were under the law, but we should live in the spirit, uh, in, the, in the newness of the spirit. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. So the law isn't sinful. It just simply turned the light on sin. He said, I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. I wouldn't even know I was doing something wrong until the law showed me that I was. It said, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, using the commandment, wrought in me all manner of of concupiscence. That's a weird word there. But, but without the law, sin was dead. In other words, I didn't know I was a sinner until the law came in. The law showed me I was a sinner. It magnified my sin. So that's the reason for the law. And, and the second half of that, uh, is, the second half of verse 19 says, Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand 
of a mediator. Well, I ain't got to that part yet, but anyway. So, so the law was meant to prepare us for the work of the Messiah. It was given until the seed should come. What seed? Till Jesus should come. It's not seeds, it's seed. He is the, he's the one that's referred to that. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Well, and uh, we're, we belong to Christ. Amen? Jesus said, and, and, and by the way, it, it isn't that the law of Moses was revoked when Jesus came. Did you know Jesus didn't revoke the law of Moses? It's still, it's still there. The law of Moses is still in effect. Listen to what Matthew 5, 17 says. It says, Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law. He didn't. He said, Or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy or change anything. He said, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, again, the law of Moses is still there. The law of Moses, God still holds that out there as the standard of perfection. But the thing is, none of us could ever reach it. And Jesus did for us. So, again, He fulfilled the law. So, in other words, we're not under it anymore. Praise God, we're set free from that. The law of Moses is no longer our grounds for approaching God. We don't have to go through the law of Moses. We come, we come to Jesus Christ. And He fulfilled it for us. Amen. The Bible said it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. According to ancient traditions, true traditions, according to Paul, the law was delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai by the hand of, hands of angels. It says right there, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Angels were the go-between or the mediator for Moses when he received the law from God. That says, now a mediator. This is one of the weirdest verses in the Bible. And so many people... They've come up with a different definition for this verse. So I'm going to do my best at it here. Uh, different, different explanation. But it says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. <clears throat> Moses needed a mediator between himself and God. Because Moses was not holy. And therefore he had to have the law delivered to him. And... and but the thing is, we don't, we don't, we don't need a mediator between us and Jesus, Amen. Because He is our mediator, Amen. What is a mediator? That's somebody who makes peace between two parties. And what did He do when He came and He lived a perfect life and He died on the cross and He was He was buried and He rose from the grave? He made He made a way for us to come straight to God, Amen. I ain't got to go through no temple. I ain't got to go into no priest. I ain't got to go in no confessional booth. I ain't got to go. Uh, and tell all my sins to somebody. I go straight to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He is my mediator. Amen. And again, the law was a two-part, two-party agreement between, uh, brought in by mediators. And Christ is our, again, He's our mediator. And salvation in Jesus by faith is received by a promise. And like I said, this verse is a, is, is an obscure verse. Somebody said, somebody said they'd read 250 different interpretations of it. That's a lot of different interpretations of that same verse. So, But the general thought of this verse, uh, I'm just going to read you what the man who said that said. He said, the general thought seems to be that the promise must be considered superior to the law because the law is two-sided. The law was mediated, and this means that man was a party to it. Okay, so if man's involved with something, you know what he's going to do. He's going to mess it up. That's why the law wasn't effective, right? So the promise, on the other hand, it, it, man's not a party to that. This is all God's doing, and that's why, that's why the promise is, is superior to the law, the promise of salvation by grace through faith, faith in Jesus Christ. So anyway, let's move on from that. Uh, is the law then against the promises of God, we're asked? God forbid is the law then against the promises of God? So you've got, again, you've got the law, and then you've got grace, right? Okay, and, there, and it, would, it would seem as though these two are diametrically opposed, but they're actually not. The law is not something evil. The law is not opposing God's promise. The, prob the problem with the law is is found in the fact that the law has no ability to give strength to anybody that wants to keep it. You say, I want to keep the law. I really do, but the law ain't going to help you. The law's just going to continue to point out all your faults. 
It'll never encourage you. It'll always discourage you. I mean, if the law could have given somebody life, then it would have brought righteousness to everybody, but it didn't do that. The law of Moses brings no life. It just states the command. It tells you to keep it and tells you the consequences if you break it. So there's no hope there. Amen? Because none of us could ever keep it. And the picture uh, just shows us our imprisonment under sin. Uh, verse 22, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. So all of us were prisoners under, under the law that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So the Scripture concluded that we're all under sin. And Paul paints it like we're all, we're all prisoners. We're all imprisoned by the law. The bars of the cell are, are sin, keeping us locked up. And the Scripture puts us in prison because it points out our sinful condition. So we're in trouble. We're, we're a mess. So there we sat before we got saved, imprisoned in sin, and the law couldn't help us. We couldn't do a thing for us because the law is the one that put us in prison. Somebody, some people might say, well, I'm not a prisoner of sin. Yes, you are. I can prove it to you. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. Show me you're not a prisoner of your sin. Just stop sinning then. You can't do that, can you? Uh -uh. So, again... If you can stop, if you can stop sinning, you know, well, you better than everybody else. But if you can't stop sinning, then then you're imprisoned by the law of God because again, you're held captive by it, and it's going to take you all the way to hell if you're if you're imprisoned by it. But listen here, the thing of it is, Jesus says to us what in Matthew eleven twenty eight, He says, "Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest." In other words, I'll set you free from that. You labored and heavy laden. You got all this on you. Come to me, and I'll give, I'll give you rest. It says that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can break us out of our confinement of sin. He is the key that unlocks the door that lets us free. The law of Moses can show us our problem. It can clearly show us our problem. It can clearly show us God's standard. The law does that very good. Amen? Again, it shows you where you're wrong. It shows you where God's right. It's excellent at that. But, it cannot give us the freedom from it. Only Jesus can. And that freedom is only given to them that believe. I mean, the bars of our sin are strong. I don't know if you've tried to wrestle through them before, but you can't cut your way out of them bars. They got you in there pretty tight. There ain't, no, ain't no chance of a jailbreak. <clears throat> Instead, what happens is the offer is made by the warden himself. He's going to simply open the door for you where you can walk out. But you have to admit you're confined first. You've got to admit first you're, you deserve to be there. You're locked away. I'm helpless. I have no way out of here. I deserve to be in this cell. And i got to ask Jesus to free me from it because there's no other way out. I can rattle the bars and kick the bars all day long and scream and holler, this is not fair. I shouldn't be here. I'm a good person. But that ain't going to get me out of there. It's only when I realize I deserved it. And thank you, Lord, that you made a way for me. He'll free you. Verse 23 through 25. The law of Moses, again, the law which condemns us. It's our tutor. It's our schoolmaster, the Bible tells us. It's like a, a guardian watching over us to bring us to Jesus. Verse 23 through 25. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So before, it says, before faith come, before, before faith came, before we got saved by grace, 
through faith. Before we lived our lives by faith, we were kept guard, kept under guard by the law. Again, the law, the law was in charge of us. It wasn't grace at that point because we didn't have grace. And we were, again, we were imprisoned by our own sin under the law. <clears throat> but there's also another sense in which the law guarded us in a protective custody. So how does that work? Well, the, the law, I mean, God's Word explains that to us. How, how does the law protect us? Well, I can tell you one way, because as you read the Old Testament, it ain't just a rule, a, a long list of do's and don'ts. It reveals to us God's heart. It shows us who God is. It reveals how much He, he loves us because He wants us to be free from all this sin. He wants us to be victorious. So it, it protects us by, again, showing us one who loves us. It protects us, secondly, by showing us the best way to live. You say, well, I can't live up to that, but you can sure see it. You can sure see there's the bar right there, even if you can't reach it. At least you know there's a standard higher than yourself. So the law protects you and saying, hey, you are not good enough. You are not there. You can't achieve that. You, you, you're a ways off. You, listen, you need, you're going to have to do something different. It's, if you never knew that, you'd never want to be saved. Amen? It protects us by showing what should be right and wrong among men. I know there are a lot of good moral people out there who are not saved. There are decent people who, who live good and, and, and they treat their children right and they treat their neighbors right and they give to charitable causes and they volunteer. They do all kinds of wonderful things. They're not saved, but they're good people. Okay? And again... I, I can tell you why that is. It's because we live in a society that has been governed by the Word of God. And the standards that were set in this nation were, set, were set when people held the Word of God up higher than, than, than just about anything. And so our laws are based, our, our moral laws in America are based upon God. And are based, are based upon God's Word and based upon the Ten Commandments. And so what morality is in America is a byproduct of the Word of God. It sure didn't come from Hinduism. It sure didn't come from Buddhism. It sure didn't come from, from Islam. Amen. It sure didn't come from Catholicism. I can tell you it came from Christianity. It came from the Word of God. So the law protected us by giving us the guidelines of right and wrong. It protects us by, pro by providing a foundation, again, like I said, for civil law to be set up. Again, our court systems are based upon God's moral laws. So in these ways and more, we were kept under guard by the law, even though we didn't know it, even though we was growing up in it and didn't realize it. And the Bible says in the second half of verse 23 that we were shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now the law of Moses prepared us to come to Jesus. And it did that by the way it reveals God's character. Showed us who God is. Showed us how much He loves us. Showed us how forgiving and how merciful He is. But it also, it also showed us, uh, it, it, it exposed to us our sin. It showed us how good God is, but it also showed us our sin. So it prepared us. And I, again, you say, oh, God's wonderful. He loves everybody. And everybody says, well, I, you know, because God loves everybody. I, I guess I'm saved too. No, that ain't how it works. No. God's character, when you see how, much, how, God, how God is, you see that God is a holy God and God's a loving God. And, and God, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, but still God is a holy God and He demands perfection and so He has to, the Son of God has to be, He has to be laid upon our account and there's no way. There's no way for us to come to God. And therefore the law was our tutor. It was our schoolmaster, like I said, tutor uh, situation to bring us to Christ, to show us, to say, look, here's what God expects and you can't do it. So you're going to have to have someone to do this for you. Again, it's like a it's like a uh, it's like a teacher would do, instructing and teaching along the way. And 
And, 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 and why? So that we come and we realize it and we get justified by what Christ has done and not trying to do it ourselves and failing and, and missing heaven. The whole purpose of the law, again, is not to condemn us, but to bring us to Jesus. So if somebody doesn't present the law in a manner that brings people to, to faith in Jesus, then they're not presenting the law correctly. If all you do is walk away from somebody preaching or teaching the law and you feel totally hopeless, then they didn't do it right. Y'all know who Ray Comfort is? Y'all know who Ray Comfort is? He, he does a lot of... He used to be partnered up with old Kirk Cameron who was on TV. And uh, they have a thing called Way of the Master. I'm not necessarily 100% in everything he does because he gets off, off into some into some stuff that that a little sketchy to me, but... But I do like the way he presents things. He brings people to the point. I think I've showed you this before. But he, he'll ask somebody, well, he's sitting there talking to him. He said, now, let me ask you this. You know, you're going to be held to God's standard, not mine. And, and the Bible says, thou shalt, you know, that, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness. Have you ever told a lie? And of course, all of them. Yeah, I've told a lie. Have you ever sold anything? Uh, yeah, when I was younger. So you already admitted that you're a lying thief. Okay, the Bible. Jesus said, "If a man looks upon a woman to, uh, to lust after, he's already committed adultery in his heart." Have you ever looked upon a person with lust in your heart? Well, yeah. So you're a lying, thieving adulterer. Okay, it doesn't take long for a person to be smitten by the law. He takes them to that point to show them that they need Jesus. They need to be born again. So again, I I, I have no problem with somebody doing that. Amen. And that's the purpose. That's the purpose of the law. It's to show us that we are we fall short that we don't measure up. So. If somebody, like I said, if they don't present it right, they're not, uh, they don't show it. If it doesn't lead to faith in Jesus, it's not done right. Uh, and the way that Jesus presented the law, the way he always did it, was to show people they couldn't fulfill it. And they needed to look outside their, their law keeping to find righteousness greater than the scribe, scribes and the Pharisees. Again, you remember the rich young ruler who came, came to Jesus and, he, and you know, he said, I've kept all the commandments all from my youth up. So I'm, 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 hey, I should be good enough. And Jesus said, well, go and sell everything you got and give it to the poor and come back and see me. And he went away sorrowful because he had many riches. And God showed him that he cared more about his riches on earth than he did riches in heaven. Again, Jesus used the law to show him that his covetousness in his heart would keep him out of heaven. Um, Satan tries to convince us to prove ourselves holy by the law. You know, again, he does. He tries to get us to live. He tries to get people to live good enough to please God. He tries to trick people into believing that somehow you're going to be a good enough. Why not, so why is, why, not, why is hundreds, thousands of people stood there at the door, doorstep and told me I'm a, good, I'm a good person? Why is that always the defense? Well, I'm a good person. It's because they believe somehow when they get there, they're, they're gonna, they believe the whole notion that they're going to stand before St. Peter at the gate, which that ain't in the Bible, and you and I both know that. They think because the Catholics down there have taught that you're going to stand before St. Peter and he's going to go through the books and he's going to see if you, if you get let in or he pulls a trap door handle and you go straight to hell. That's what they believe. That's what a lot of people believe. You know why they believe that trap door business? Because they saw that on Bugs Bunny. That's why. They, you know, Bugs Bunny even talked about heaven and hell back in the day. But they had the wrong, they had the wrong notion. But people think they can be good enough. And Satan wants so bad for everybody to think that. But the Bible says, but after that faith has come, after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. And what is the schoolmaster? That's the law. So once faith has come, once we have come to the realization that we are lost sinners and we cannot save ourselves and we cannot be righteous enough and that Jesus has fulfilled everything, He's fulfilled all righteousness, He's done that for us, He's paid our debt, He's satisfied the wrath of Almighty God, He's opened the door of salvation. Amen. When we come to that and we believe on Christ, there's no need for us to go back under the law. Once we've come into relationship of faith, we no longer have to live under that schoolmaster. Now that don't mean we forget everything he taught us. Amen? That don't, listen, the Bible is written for examples for us. The Bible tells us that. The Old Testament, it was written there for examples for us. So we're not to forget it, but we're not under it. 
We respect the one that taught us. We look back on it and go, you better believe it. That's right. Every bit of that's right. We got all kind of respect for it, but again, we're not living under its stipulations. We're not living under its strictness. We're not under that anymore. We live under Jesus. We live under Him by faith. We're trusting in His finished work and not in our work at all. By faith, we find our identity in Him. Amen? I am a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by anything I ever did. Verse 26 and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You see that? Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And somewhere a church of Christ went, oh, there it is. I can just, I can just feel it. Somewhere out in the internet world, a church of Christ just said, he said, you've been baptized. But that's not what that's saying. Before anybody wonders about that, I'll cover that in a second. The Bible says, For all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So compared to what was being taught among the Galatians, man, this is a revolutionary statement right here. Because again, they're all teaching that you're all children of God by keeping the law. They're teaching, well, you live like a Jew, then you can be in Christ Jesus. So again, this is absolutely contrary to what these people from Jerusalem were coming up and teaching in the churches of Galatia. This is blowing everybody's mind what Paul's teaching here. <coughs> Traditional Jewish thinking, which is carried over into Christianity by Jewish Christians, in that kind of thinking, you're standing where God is measured by how well you obey the law. And so for you to be truly close to God, again, this is Jewish thinking. This is not Christian. This is, this is early. And again, before we, before we just absolutely vilify these people, we need to understand still that Christianity is in a transition between the law and grace. Again, so it's not shocking to me that you had... You had some Jews who were extremely dedicated to the law who had a really hard time prying loose from it. It's not shocking to me. They lived their whole life trying to, trying to be perfect. And then to be told, you don't have to be perfect. You just need to be in Christ. I, I'm sure that was hard pill for them to swallow. And it was probably hard for them to get truly saved. But again, this was during a transition period, and I'm not one to stand back and point fingers. I'm going to leave that in God's, in, in God's court to figure that out. But, but again, to, 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 be, to be truly close to God, they, they, they taught, you know, to be considered sons of God, that you, that, that you had to be extremely observant of the law. You had to really keep it, just like the scribes and the Pharisees were. But here Paul is saying that we, we can be considered sons of God in a completely different way. And, that, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what makes us the sons of God. And the standing that we have here is impressive. It says, it, it, you know, to be, among, to be among the sons of God means that we have a special relationship with God as our loving and caring Father. To be his son, to be his daughter. I mean, that when well, you talk about a close relationship there, to be considered a son or a daughter of God, I mean, that's a powerful position to be in. And how did you get there? Did you keep the law? No, I didn't do a thing but believe on Jesus, and he put me there. What a thing, amen? What a gift. That's why the Bible calls it a gift of God. You didn't, you didn't deserve that. There ain't a one of us in here ever been good one day good enough to deserve what God has done for us. But he's given us such a powerful standing. I mean, think about that. That's who you truly are. Man, if we could get our head around that, our life would get so much better. If you could realize that you, in God's eyes, you are his son, you are his daughter. That makes you pretty important, doesn't it? That gives you pretty good access, doesn't it? That means if you, that, listen to me, it means if you get your eyes on Jesus and you submit to God and pray and talk to him and, 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 and live in his love, God's going to bless you. Or if you just keep doing it your way and forget that he's leaving there half the time, then you're going to have a rough road to hold. It's up to you whether you want to love him and walk in his light or not. 
Like I said, the standing we have is impressive because of what Christ has done. He, he put us in a place of closeness that we didn't have before. He, he put us in a place of affection that we didn't have before. He put us in a place of special care and attention that we didn't have before. And not only is the standing impressive, but the method is impressive. To become a son of God through faith in Christ Jesus means a whole lot more than believing that he exists or did certain things. To put your trust in him now, for both now and for eternity. That, that's the method. I mean, it's just us trusting. It's just us believing. Again, it's not anything that you have a special talent for. Anybody can have it. That's the wonderful thing about it. And the great thing is, anybody can share it. Anybody can tell it. You can still get people saved. You can still see people around you come to Christ. There's no reason why everybody you know hadn't heard the gospel yet. Because we have it. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. All right, I'm going to keep going. He said... Verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. Understand, he's using a picture of baptism. He's not literally trying to say that baptism puts you into Christ. I'll explain what it means. The, 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 the crystal clear thing here to me is what he says we're baptized into. It doesn't say we're baptized into water. It says we're baptized into Christ. Amen? Just, just as in water, in a, a water baptism, a person is baptized and immersed in the water, right? So when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are immersed into Jesus. Amen? And that baptism is a picture of that. Amen? But the problem is we've got too many Christians that just tries to dip a toe. In. They don't want immersed. They got too many people that don't want the full thing. They don't want. They don't want all that. They don't want to be. I don't want to be a fanatic. The Bible says that we're peculiar, zealous, peculiar. That means odd. That means a little bit weird. That means everybody looks at you a little funny. But some people say, I don't want all that. I don't want. I don't want anybody looking at me like I'm weird. I don't want to think I'm a religious nut. It might not be a bad idea. I take, I, I, I take being a religious nut over a, somebody as cold as a stone any day. Amen? But when we, when we look, you know, when a, person gets a, when a person gets immersed in water, you don't really see the person, you see the water. And when a person is immersed in Christ or baptized into Christ, you're not supposed to see much of them anymore. You're supposed to see Christ. Amen? So I, I think that's the idea of being baptized into Christ. You know, this is the baptism that saves. Baptism into Christ when we become part of Him. When we, when, we, when we trust Him and become a child of God, it's not when we're baptized in water. You know, if a person isn't baptized into Jesus, they could be dunked a thousand times in water. It wouldn't make a bit of difference. Not one bit. But if a person has been baptized into Christ, then he ought to follow through and go and, and do what Jesus told him to do and receive baptism as a demonstration that he has received Christ as his Savior so that you have then, you have, you then. Listen, what's the reason for that? Because it is, listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't do it in secret. He, did, he died for our sins publicly. So he wants us to identify ourselves publicly with him and what he did for us publicly. So that's why we're to get baptized so that we put on our Jesus uniform saying I'm identifying with the death of my Savior, his burial, and his resurrection. And again, that's, that's why a person ought to be baptized. And the Bible says many as have put on Christ. And another way of expressing that is to say we put him on. In the, in the original language, the, the, this phrase has the idea of putting on a suit of clothes. Like when I got up, I put on this black shirt and these gray breeches. I, I put those on. I clothed myself in, in, these, in these dress clothes. Well, I also clothed myself like 47 years ago in Jesus Christ. 
Amen. I put on Christ when I was a little boy. And you know what? People ought to see that. They ought to see that we belong to Christ when they look at our life. It ought not be something that sneaks up on somebody. We ought to live with an awareness that we are covered or adorned with Jesus Christ. It ought not, again, it ought not be a secret. There ought not be any secret disciples or secret believers. It, we ought to live for Jesus out loud in the open. Amen? Publicly, cheerfully. Joyfully, publicly. Now let's look at the last two and we're almost done. <clears throat> we're on equal standing with everybody who comes to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 28 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, he makes this statement, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, that might not mean a whole lot to us right now reading this, but I'm going to tell you something. At the church in Galatia, this, this blowed everybody's mind. Because, again, you've got the argument between what? The Jew, Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers... So uh, that's what he means here. And they're saying, well, we can't fellowship with them and they can't fellowship with us and they're not real believers because they're not like us. And so there was this big uh, division between the two. And Paul comes out and says, there ain't no such thing, neither one of y'all. Neither one of y'all. There ain't no Jew and Greek. He's saying, listen, this is some totally different than what you understand. The whole problem among the Galatian Christians is that some wanted to still observe the dividing line between the Jews and the Greek. And Paul writes in Jesus Christ, that line's done away with. When we're in Jesus, we're all in Jesus. There's not two camps in Jesus. If you're a Jew and you're in Jesus, then you're in Jesus. If you're a Gentile and you're in Jesus, you're just in Jesus. Amen? I'm a believer. I'm not what I was. It says there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So, the dividing line between Jew and Greek is not the only dividing line that gets erased here. Regarding our standing before God in Jesus, every dividing line is erased. Now that Jesus is our identity, that's more important than any prior identity that we had before. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Now you think about that. He said, you know, there's neither, there's neither bond nor free. That means there's neither, there's neither a slave nor a free man. Doesn't make no difference. You say, well, wait a minute. This one, he's a, he's a, he's a, he, he belongs to this man over here. And this guy, he was born free. But Paul said, well, it doesn't matter. In Christ, not that that man isn't still a, a bond slave, but in, in Christ, he's still their brother. Amen? You say, and here's the situation. You might have a household. Back then, they had bond slaves. So you had somebody who had sold themselves to you to work off a debt. They're working in your home. And, and say they got saved that Sunday. And you were already saved. Now, you all you know, the relationship there is going to be a little different in the house. You're going to treat that fellow a little different. Because he's your brother in Christ now. So we're not, again, what Paul is trying to say is when a person comes to Christ, all these lines that blur us and divide us seem to disappear. He says, if you be Christ. If you be Christ. That's the real issue. That's the only issue. It's not whether you're Jew or Gentile. Is it, are you Jesus? Do you belong to him? Are you Christ? The issue is not, are you, are you under the law? And the issue is not, are you Jew or Gentile? The issue is not, are you a slave or a free man? The issue is not, are you a man or a woman? The only issue is, are ye Christ? And if you're Christ, then we have a home in eternity. A home. Amen? A place we're headed to. Why? Because we're sons and daughters of God. And our Father has prepared us a place. Jesus said, I go, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. 
So we have a home in eternity, a home that He made for us. In Christ, if we're in Christ, not only do we have a home in eternity, but we find our place in society because we have brothers and sisters in the family of God all over the place. Amen? I could literally go to any town in America and find a Baptist church somewhere and go in and find somebody I could fellowship with. I have brothers and sisters in every town. My friend Leo Lytle this morning, he's in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Saw so yesterday he was going to Gulf Shores, Alabama. I've been there on vacation a number of times. He posted that he was going to be he was going to be at, at Shell Shell Lakes Baptist Church, and I said Shell Lakes. I've been to that church. I visited that church one time on vacation down there. So I thought that's crazy. He's down there in that church. I've been in that church before. I, I, you know, just weird to me. That he'd been, he's in the church where I was at. And it's a little tiny church out in the middle of nowhere. But, he, you know, I thought about that little church. I walked in that church that Sunday didn't know anybody from Adam. But you know what? They were all coming up to me, shaking my hand, welcoming me. Every church I've ever been to, that's happened. And we have that. We have that place. Amen. That we didn't have before. You take somebody who ain't saved, come in here and sit in the back. They'll sit there quiet and stoic as they can, and they get up, and get ready to leave, and everybody try to shake their hand. They look uncomfortable as all get out. Why? Because they don't feel a part of things. But you what? Let them get saved and let them get in Christ, and pretty quick they'll be glad hand and shaking hands with everybody and, and hugging necks. Why? Because they realize I'm part of a family. God gives us so much more than just, I ain't going to hell. He gives us a home in heaven. He gives us a family here on earth. And we find our place in history. But why? Because we're a part of God's plan for the ages. And I can tell you, my friends, we're at a crucial point in history. We are at a very powerful, crucial point in history. And, and God put you and I here to live in this moment, here at the end of the age. God put us here at this crucial juncture. And you and I are related spiritually to Abraham. Amen? By faith in Jesus, we all got the same faith. Abraham had the same faith you got. He believed God. In Christ, I find my identity. It ain't in this world. I find my identity in Jesus Christ. I'm a son of God. Amen? You're a son of God and a daughter of God. In Christ, I'm united to all the redeemed people of the whole wide world. The whole, the whole wide world. All the redeemed of all time. Past, present, and future. I'm connected to every one of them. And someday I'll stroll down Heaven's Avenue and I'll see all the saints of God from the Old Testament. I'll see all them names that runs down through numbers that I couldn't pronounce. And you know what? I'll know every single one of them. And they'll all be glad to see me and I'll be glad to see every one of them. Amen. I'll never forget. Mama asked me one time. She said, do you think we'll get to heaven? She said, the only thing I worry about getting to heaven is not being able to find you for a while. You remember telling me that? What did I tell you? I said, it won't matter because you'll know as you're known. So you'll know everybody there. So you, it, you'll be talking to people on the way to seeing me. I mean, you run into Abraham. Abraham would have something to say to you. He'd say, hey, Janie, or whatever your name will be then. Because you'll have a new name that, that God will give you. Amen? Amen? So you'll find your identity in Christ. Amen? Amen. In Christ, I discover my heritage, who I am. I'm related to all them people back in the Bible. Amen. When I read it, I, I related to them. In Christ, I find my foundation. Amen. Listen, I'm built on the rock, and the rock doesn't move under me. I, I, you know, you say, well, life, life gets scary. So it may get scary, but God doesn't change. And God's promises are forever. Amen. So you don't have to shake. You don't have to tremble. God has got you. And in Christ, look here, I'm home. He is my all in all. I don't worry about what the law says because hey, the law, law showed me I was a sinner a long time ago. But Jesus showed me I was a saint. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to have a song of invitation. We're going to turn to 157. 157, we're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to sing this morning. 157, the song is Jesus just, Jesus paid it all. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you so much. I thank you, Father, for, for Jesus. Thank you for everlasting life through the blood of your dear Son. But Lord, I thank you that you washed me in that blood so long ago. Thank you that I'm part of the redeemed. I thank you for each one in here according to their testimony has that same salvation. Lord, I pray you work in our lives. Lord, you know the needs of your people. 
Lord, you know decisions that need to be made in lives. Lord, I pray, Father, you, you, Holy Spirit of God, you show us those things that we need to do, steps we need to take to grow in the faith. Lord God, I pray, Father, folks should do that. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you continue to work in our lives and bring us into a closer relationship with thee. Father, I pray if somebody out there listening to me today, under the sound of my voice comes a realization that they're not saved. I pray today be the day that they bow their head and they put their faith in, in Jesus and trust what his finished work on Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection, and they believe on Christ for eternal life. Lord, I pray you bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing 157. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in me is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus made it all. all Amen. I'm so thankful to be a child of God this morning.